This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Starting today's show is Elliot Dennis, University of Nebraska at Lincoln Livestock Economist, with this week's cattle market update. He talks about the current market and what meat demand differences he saw on his recent international travel. K-State's Rebecca Dale, Ignacio Ciampitti, and A.J. Sharda continue the show as they give an update on the Institute for Digital Agriculture and Advanced Analytics at K-State and how they are participating in the International Conference on Precision Agriculture this week. Another segment of Faces in Agriculture rounds out today's show. Jeff Oaks, who's involved in agriculture in Elk County, says what his team does at Flint Oak. That and more is coming up ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Monday show with a cattle market update with University of Nebraska at Lincoln livestock economist Elliot Dennis. Elliot, thanks for joining us today. Yes, thanks for having me again, Shelby. Elliot, starting our conversation off with what are you seeing for feeder cattle? Yeah, so really, as I started to talk with producers, they're kind of gearing up for the fall, weaning, should we be early weaning? Really, when we're looking at, you know, what are the factors that could really drive early weaning? For us, it has a lot to do with pasture conditions. We're seeing really good pasture conditions really throughout the U.S. When we think about where we're at, we're well above the five-year average in almost every region. So for us in the Northern Plains, generally our, you know, we're at the five-year average is about a 65. We're at almost a 72 on on that index. And really the only place that's showing signs of really stress is in that Southeast, only region that's, um, that's really kind of really struggling with that. So for us, we don't see a lot of early weaning starting to happen. Uh, a lot of people are more gearing up for kind of a, a normal weaning season and uh, kind of thinking about what month they should be starting to to kind of target. So when, when we start to talk to them, we think about kind of that September, October, November, and then we have do, do have some people that kind of retain over to, uh, into the January uh, month. But Really, there's really no difference on the CME board. Really, everything's trading at about 258, a uh, hundred weight. And really, when you look at really the trend of where we've been at, almost in every month, that's been trading really sideways, which isn't a great thing. You know, traders don't like seeing things trade sideways for long periods of time. But we've really been in this, I'd say, kind of plus or minus ten dollars a hundred weight, anywhere from that two, you know, two fifty to two sixty range. Really since, you know, mid-April, uh, we've had some highs and then some lows, but but it's almost stayed within that range. So Mark is still kind of sorting out, uh, sorting out, you know, where can we be? Uh, and really, we can we kind of contrast that to where we're at in the cash market. Um, I think they're just concerned about, you know, is the future going to come up and meet the cash or is the cash going to start coming down? And what are some numbers we're seeing for the cash market? We've seen the cash market really start to have large movements, um, which has kind of led to these discussions about, you know, what's going to happen? Is the cash going to come down to meet the futures? The future is going to come down to meet the cash. But where we're at in, in Nebraska for five, six weights is uh, a little over 350. Um, and so when we're thinking about kind of where we were at last year, uh, we really started, we were increasing throughout that entire year um, and really kind of leveling off at this uh, three, $300, a uh, hundred weight, uh, really throughout you know, the entire fall, so kind of the uh, fall run, we started well above last year. We were at already over $300 a hundredweight uh, when we started this year. And uh, we really kind of just continued up to about at about 350 So that's kind of where we're at on the, on the five, six weights that on the seven, seven, eight weights is another one that, that we track. We are still well above we were last year in 2023. We started off the year, you know, around that 180, 190 range. From 2003, we were at already at 240 when we began the year, and we're at nearly $300 or $300 100 on seven, eight weights. So there's a lot of optimism out there that prices can continue to rise, um, but uh, basis is really what people are, are, are watching closely right now. Elliot, you mentioned basis, and before the interview, you told me that Nebraska right now is seeing some fairly high basis. Yeah, basis is extremely high for us in Nebraska right now you know, in locations that we've, we've never seen before as well. And so when we're thinking about that five, six, 
uh, weight basis. I mean, we're we're talking about basis north of eighty dollars or plus eighty. When we think about where we're at in our maximum between twenty eighteen and and twenty twenty three. That maximum basis that we'd ever seen in in that October range has was been plus sixty, uh, and and this June July month the, the highest we'd ever seen was also about plus sixty. So when we're thinking about kind of where we could be at, if we take where we're at on the, the futures price plus what we might you know experience for basis, you know we're in that you know three dollars and and forty cents range or three forty or kind of where the market was was trading at. So. A lot of people have been, you know, a little bit nervous about this. You know, there always is concern if the cash market's going to come down, if it's going to weaken. But I think when we were kind of talking with producers, the question was, what is that? What is that price that we're willing to that that we're willing to receive? And if we have kind of this expectation of basis, what type of risk management strategies are we using? Of that price that we're already seeing with futures plus historical basis, can we lock in some of that profit? Uh, right now, given some potential uncertainty as we head into the fall, and and it's also in an election year. Elliot also wanted to mention the Fed cattle harvest. Yeah, Fed cattle harvest is has been really intriguing this year uh, for a lot of reasons. The first has been, you know, we've had you know tight numbers, uh, but when we really uh, when we talk about the Fed cattle slaughter, we're often talking about harvest weights. Uh, harvest weights ha- are finally starting to go down. Uh, steer weights are, are have been coming down from about 920. They're down about 912. Um, and also uh, the heifer weights have, have really started to come down really since about April, you know, the April, May-ish to about, they're about 835 now. So they are starting to come down, but uh, there are this, you know, when we look at where we're at on kind of that seasonal trend is this is actually the time that harvest weight starts to, has seasonally started to come back up. Uh, we normally kind of bottom out at, you know, a month, month and a half prior to this. So uh, where were you actually going to go with those those dress weights, I think is uh, t- to remain to be seen. Um, I think there's some kind of discussion about, you know, how much the, the plants have to, to run, uh, number of uh, cattle that are out there. This week, for instance, we saw uh, total cattle slaughter, you know, drop down to below what they were in 2023 and well below where they're at in 2025 to about 517,000 head on, on a weekly kill. So there is some things that need to be sorted out there. And also when we think about kind of well, how to feed lots, you know, they have to make money, right? And kind of where that looks like on projections, that cost of gain uh, to actually feed a steer is going down at, and, you know, beginning of the year, we were at about, you know, $125, hundred weight. And now we're, you know, in that 115 range. This comes from K-State's focus on feedlot. And some of the projections that are out there about, you know, how do we use some of that uh, reported feedlot closeout data? And we say, well, what does this look like for profitability? And it really looks that it's centered, or, you know, centered around zero. There's some months where, you know, where feedlots are projected to make money. There's some months that they're projected to lose money. And really, it has to do with where is that kind of feeder cattle price going to come in at? So the feeder cattle price either has to come down a little bit or that fed cattle price that we're projecting needs to come up a little bit in order for feedlot profitability to improve. Wanting to round out our conversation then today, Elliot, looking about on an international perspective, something really important to the cattle market. Yeah, so exports have always been, you know, a huge portion of of where we're able to, you know, take the beef that we produce in in the US and get it to international customers, build demand, right? That's how we one of the ways that we can build demand. We a lot of the focus has tended to be uh, in Southeast Asia. We have our strong markets, Japan, South Korea, uh, and parts of China. But there's this large, let's say, growing interest in trying to get our beef over into the European Union. A lot of that has to do with non hormone treated cattle and more specialty cattle, but still a large segment where we can continue to grow. Recently, I was over there and had some opportunity to spend some time in Switzerland. And it was interesting to kind of see and, and meet with producers there and, and get their uh, perspective on meat, livestock production. And really, there's this strong preference for, you know, domestically raised uh, beef, which isn't a strong, uh, I'd say, strong segment in in Switzerland. But uh, And really, there, there tends to be this preference for more of kind of processed meats. 
Um, and when we talk about kind of fresh meat demand, there is a big emphasis over there on dry aging beef. So even if they get beef that's harvested, that dry age, you know, minimum is generally 50 days. Uh, and so this is a little bit, a little bit different than this would be more of like on your you know, local butchers that's uh, in the U.S. that are going to dry age even close to that many days. So really just kind of this different amount of, you know, the type of products they're bringing to the market, the consumer demand of kind of what the types of meat they like to eat. And some of this is really driven by that price. You know, we're talking about, you know, for what I'd consider a, a low choice meat, uh, you know, steak, you know, it's going to cost you 30, close to $30 a pound. So there's a reason why they don't eat as much of it. But even things like when we think about substitutes like pork and chicken, those are extremely expensive. Like, you know, chicken was, you know, around $15 a pound. So, so really meat consumption is low uh, in Switzerland. Uh, there's a strong, obviously, dairy presence there. So a lot of cheese, yogurts. Um, but uh, meat demand in particular there is uh, a little bit a little bit lighter and the, the variety of, of meats that they eat is definitely different than what we traditionally consume here in the U.S. Elliot, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and give us our cattle market update. Yeah, thanks for having me, Shelby. That was University of Nebraska at Lincoln livestock economist Elliot Dennis. If you'd like to check out the feedlot returns report, you can do so by going to agmanager.info or I will also link it in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Monday show talking about the Institute for Digital Agriculture and Advanced Analytics and the International Conference on Precision Agriculture with Rebecca Dale, who is the program manager of the Institute for Digital Agriculture and Advanced Analytics, as well as she's joined by some of the administrative team, Ignacio Ciampitti and A.J. Sharda. Rebecca, Ignacio, A.J., thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. Good morning. Thank you, Shelby, for having us. Rebecca, starting off with, you've been newer in the position as program manager for what we are going to call ID3A. And how has that been and how is the Institute going? Yes, I have been a part of the um, Institute for Digital Ag and Advanced Analytics since uh, March of this year. And it has been fabulous. It has been a fun group of team members to work with, learning something new every day. It's really been taking off in the last couple months with meeting with different groups across campus of how we can work with them. Uh, We've recently met with quite a few faculty members and researchers from the animal science and industry department and vet med, the swine team, college of business, just trying to figure out where do we see some overlap and how can we support them through our initiatives. That's one thing we've been meeting with some industry partners on how can our technology or research innovation things be brought to market through commercialization, partnership with our research. So some of those are still in in the works and so don't want to quite give away everything yet, but some exciting things coming down. We've been working with academic units on trying to promote advanced analytics to graduate students, knowing that that's a top priority for industry whenever they graduate with their degrees and then go on to to work. And then just in, in terms of outreach, we've been participating in field days out in various parts of the state of Kansas, talking about what we do, how can we work with farmers, how can we work with producers. We've given a drone demo to some Taiwanese students that came through as part of the partnership with the KDA. And so that was really fun to have uh, Dr. Brian McCornack show off drones in the North Farm. So it's been going really well since March. And all these things were, have been happening since September of last year, too, uh, before I came on board. But we've been ramping up in the last couple months. And as this institute did come to fruition in September, like you mentioned, Rebecca, AJ, Ignacio, what have you guys been up to? Well, from our side, uh, you know, Ignacio, myself and Pascal Hissler, we are the leads for the research part of it. And uh, our goal is to definitely expand the overall scope and uh, uh, the capacity in terms of, you know, what we do as research, uh, continue to build on the existing partnerships we have, make them stronger, continue to 
have those those operations going but moving forward look very aggressively for strategic industry partners who can be uh, a core kind of a uh, collaborators you know uh, sponsors slash collaborators to develop you know innovative solutions innovative technologies innovative you know decision support tools so so we can continue to help them make informed decisions using data um, but also help them make uh, right choices in terms of selecting technology and making the best use of it to enhance their profitability and productivity uh, we have you know collectively won the gripx you know i would like to tout the, the gripx initiative on campus in that project we have a, a small industry partner from kansas and i think we're very excited to start working with him so is ignacio we always talk about how how we can make these these two way channels working with with our sponsors uh, in a very holistic and a very systematic and a very systems level way so so that's that is something going on on uh, on that but i will let, let ignacio you know say more about uh, what he has thoughts on it say jay mentioned i mean jump um, jumping very quickly into this um leading not only just for kansas but for in a regional perspective digital art and, and the relevancy of of working with new companies small business also connecting to large industry across many many aspects i mean looking at everything that is connected to artificial intelligence or connected to i mean the new topics that are coming in agriculture in in the next uh, years and it has been very heavy focus on on making those contacts connections nationally and also internationally because we have visits from other countries and and also we are working on on building this initiative to become basically leads in digital act for the, for the years to come that's one of the big exciting things we also have a very focus on our side on our end on the teaching perspective too so we have two directors Trevor Hafley and Sean Hutchinson start thinking about what initiatives and we need to get on campus and to move in new certificates no or courses for training the next generation of students and then the the side of engagement has been as Becca mentioned very very active we have many many events uh we have been all the directors going to multiple places myself particularly I've been, been presenting our team initiative in north central conference for plant pathology you know here on campus so we have been very active on on really moving out and moving this initiative that is very relevant for the university for the next years to come and wanting to talk about your guys's involvement something you're supporting or participating in is this upcoming conference of the international conference on precision agriculture taking place in manhattan july 21st to the 24th and can you share a little bit more about what your involvement participation in that looks like the conference has a structure and that goes sundays kind of the initial day but i mean that day is usually not just very heavy on presentations but it's more focused on workshops so our team has been the one leading basically developing of multiple workshops and offering to participants coming from all over the world the possibility of exploring not only just one topic but looking at what digital ai is which is very broad and then uh we have workshops that AJ is leading on on the machine vision and machinery you no know, machinery systems we have a workshop that Sean Hutchinson is leading that is more on the geographic information systems you no know, and and how to use uh that information and for storytelling too and then we have a workshop connected to the statistics and and these modern statistical tools for using bayesian approach for precision ag and then the one of the last ones that I'm the one with students leading is more on the developing these new tools that how we do we move basically information that is static into a, something that is uh, more dynamic so these are four workshops all spanning from sunday morning to sunday afternoon so for us it's very exciting and then there is another piece we are very heavily involved in one of the uh, tours that is going to be at the end of the conference now the next piece is on wednesday uh, when the conference technical sessions you know conclude then the participants would like to see how the agriculture looks like in that part of the world typically we go out either to see a you know manufacturer or you know participants are shown typical things which happen you know in that part of the world so what we are doing is we are helping to kind of steer one of the stops which is basically visiting one of our core farmer producer partner uh, in a, a lot of our on farm research so both ignacio and myself and many others on on the idta team uh, he's our partner for you know almost 9 years 10 years now 
I really want to give a shout out to Brian Martin and the Kyle Cart at Clay Center. So we are going to go to, to Martin's farm, you know, Martin's family farm. It's a privilege for us to, to be at their place uh, and for them to host all the participants at their place as well. So that stop um, is going to be the second stop for the tour participants. We would like to showcase what does precision agriculture look like in the state of Kansas for a typical farmer. Uh, we would like to uh, showcase uh, how how K State and how ID three A team interacts and partner with with producers uh, in terms of collaboratively understanding you know what are the needs of the farmers in terms of new innovations which needs to be incorporated and collaboratively understanding what brings value to to farmers operations right we want to understand that whenever and whatever the industry people you know provide as a product or what we do as a research it should be relevant and it should it should bring value to their operations so that's the core to our thing so that's that we want to showcase we're also partnering with one of our one of the local dealers we want to showcase how our farmers interact with those local you know service providers in terms of collecting data sharing data using data and how does that data bring value to them? So we're going to show this nexus of how our typical farmers work, collects data, use data, brings value in our addition to his farming operation. So really excited to showcase that part. We're going to showcase some of the latest technology on his farm so that people have something to kind of uh, touch, feel, and see. So we really hope that uh, we are able to exhibit, you know, our relationship, our collaborative nature, you know, of, of our working in terms of doing on-farm research. And people can take away some of the nuances or in some of the, the challenges of doing that. And also, you know, some of the rewarding things in terms of learning collectively. How did this conference end up being in Manhattan, Kansas? And who do you recommend take the time to maybe attend this conference? Dr. Raj Kosla, Department Head for Agronomy, was instrumental in bringing uh, ICPA to Manhattan and to K-State and showcasing what we have to offer. And the conference would be best for anyone who's interested in you know, technical research for precision agriculture. They're still accepting registrations. And so we would welcome anyone in the area at K-State to continue to register and come see what this conference has to offer. That was the program manager of the Institute for Digital Agriculture and Advanced Analytics at K-State, Rebecca Dale. And she was joined by a couple members of the administrative team, Ignacio Ciampiti and A.J. Sharda. If you'd like to find out more information about this conference, you can do so by going to ispag.org backslash ICPA. I will also link it in today's show notes on actoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we conclude our Monday show with another segment of Faces in Agriculture. And this week, we're joined by someone from Elk County, Jeff Oaks. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. Well, good morning, Shelby. Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement in agriculture? You bet. So uh, we're located in the north uh, east corner of Elk County, Kansas, and uh, I'm the general manager and uh, one of the partners of Flint Oak Ranch and uh, maybe a little non-traditional type of agriculture here in Kansas where we're actually, I guess, uh, we'd be farming pheasants, I guess, versus wheat, corn, or soybeans. What else takes place at Flint Oak? Well, we're uh, lucky enough to uh, about eight months out of the year, we have a private membership hunting resort where we have about 700 members scattered across the United States that either fly in, drive in, and uh, they come to Kansas to uh, experience what we have uh, a lot of, and that is uh, beautiful outdoors, fantastic bird dogs. Uh, we've got a really nice lodge here at the ranch, uh, great accommodations. Food's pretty important, so we serve a lot of uh, Kansas beef uh, to these folks while they're here hunting, and uh, generally just show them a good time here in Kansas. And as you manage Flint Oak, what have been some of the biggest challenges? Oh, my goodness. Here in the last couple of years, we've been extremely dry. So our cover and habitat 
food plots, et cetera, have suffered a little bit due to the droughts. Uh, I've had a pretty good spring this year, uh, but other big challenges, you know, staffing is pretty tough anymore across uh, a lot of industries. And this is a kind of a specialized industry. So staffing, uh, it presents its challenges at times. It's so another uh, challenge, Shelby, would be just getting the word out of uh, on what product we've got it's a unique business. It's uh, kind of a tough business to market. You know, a shotgun approach doesn't work on a niche market like this. So you've got to take a rifle approach. And uh, so we're always trying to find new ways using social media and other things uh, like that to get the word out on what we're doing. Besides using social media, what have been some really important things for telling people or growing Flint Oak? As far as growing Flint Oak, word of mouth has worked the best and people are experiencing it. It's the slowest form of... Uh, marketing there is, but oftentimes it's the greatest form as well. So uh, word of mouth has been very, very pop- positive over the 45 years of business. What have been some of your favorite things out at Flint Oak? Ranch is uh, one of my favorite things. We're blessed here with about 6,000 acres of uh, kind of a oak savanna, Flint Hills type, Chautauqua Hills. So it's a, it's a real mixed uh, piece of diversity across the ranch, beautiful piece of ground, five major lakes. So we do a lot of fishing all managed for wildlife habitat. But then the, in the off season is where we do the fishing, do the sporting clay tournaments for competitions, benefit shoots. We do a tremendous amount of dinner in the evenings. There's not much restaurant, very many restaurant facilities in the area. So we do a big business Wednesday through Saturday evening on dinner meals. Jeff, do you also run a few cattle? I do. I run uh, some stalkers on the side uh, in in our off season from hunting. It's kind of my de-wind every night to go through the cattle and uh, kind of uh, get the headaches of the ranch out of my head and uh, just enjoy the the Kansas uh, Flint Hills and uh, beautiful grass and nice black cattle grazing. Jeff, as you look forward in agriculture from the shooting side in Flint Oak and your cattle, what makes you excited? I think when what makes me so excited the most, Shelby, is w- when you get up in the morning and, and you're listening to the radio or the news and uh, uh, of all the bad things and craziness that goes on in the world, uh, we're all pretty blessed to live right here in the heartland of America. We're, we're kind of away from all that stuff. And uh, sometimes it's good just to turn the radio off, turn the TV off and uh, get outdoors. And uh, there's a lot of good in the world. And like I said, we're blessed to live right here in the middle of nowhere. Absolutely. Jeff, if someone would like to learn more information about Flint Oak, how can they do that? Uh, you can always jump on the web and uh, go to uh, flintoak.com. Uh, we're also on uh, Instagram. We're also on Facebook. Uh, of course, you can do it the old-fashioned way. You can come see us. Uh, you can pick up the telephone and call us at 620-658-4401. And uh, we still pick up the phone and uh, we still talk to our customers. Jeff, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some information about Flint Oak. Thank you, Shelby. That was Jeff Oaks, who's involved in agriculture in Elk County. In today's show notes on actday.net, I will put a link if you'd like to learn more information about Flint Oak. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow. Tomorrow.